we do what the llamas, as the llamas would say, we start with setting our motivation. So we'll do that in a very casual way. And what does it mean? It means we might say, why are we, do, you know, what, what, what's the point of doing this activity? Why are we doing it? We'd say, what is the purpose? What is the goal? They'd say motivation. Well, we're thinking we're going to have this one hour together to listen, think, analyze, contemplate. And even if there's 1% of it that makes sense, then take it and use it as a tool. That's the bottom line. It's advice, you know, it's advice. You don't have to take it. Buddha's not the boss. He's not shoving it down our throats, but it's, a, it's advice. And I promise you, as I'm saying it, I'm listening as well, I tell you. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, anxiety, stress, and uh, loneliness. I mean, in the, in the end, it's almost, it's, almost um, it's, it's the same every time. Buddha's answers, Buddha's assessment, Buddha's analysis of suffering and its causes is actually intellectually very simple, not complicated, easy to learn which is a bit shocking because when we think of our scientific models and uh, we, we are um, one of the major questions on the planet is what is happiness and how to get it? What is suffering and how to stop it? And we, and we have these deep conversations. Well, Buddha's telling us what he has found from his experience, you know, and it's intellectually to put it down is in, so simple, we almost have one, we'd have five minutes and, then, and that's the end of it, you know, saying what the problem is. So what is the problem? Well, you know, it all comes down, of course, as we've discussed already, it all comes down to the mind. Mind is not just some interesting extra thing, you know. Mind is absolutely central, as far as the Buddha is concerned, in all of our experiences. In fact, I mean, it sounds pretty cosmic to say it, but this is, lit this is logical, and we understand the big picture in Buddhism, that literally everything finally tracks back to the mind, including universes, including realms of existence, including the greatest bliss on the planet, including the, the greatest suffering. This is the Buddha's view. I mean, this is where the law of karma comes in. It's not some kind of, it's, it's this phenomenal worldview that you Indians are very familiar with, whether you put it into practice or not. I think most Indians these days are much more materialistic minded. You know, you're, you're, you're philosophical materialists, you know, like the rest of us. But it's, and the mind is what creates karma. So we need to understand the mind. So of course the word mind is very simple. We all know about the mind and we point here. We know this is the brain not for the Buddha. His expertise is not the brain. The genius Indian yogis, you know, who, who, um, who educated the Buddha, they, who, who invented this brilliant technique called shamatha, this amazing psychological skill called single-pointed concentration, samadhi, that enables you to, to go to the subtlest level of your own consciousness. This is, uh, that's their expertise, not the brain. So Buddha's expertise, is the mind insofar as it's the direct experiential cognitive process second by second by second that's buddha's expertise and that's therefore buddha's practice you know so when we understand the word buddha which is sort of incredibly simple and so delicious so tasty the end result of this whole job if one is on the mahayana path is, is you graduate as a buddha you know so bud implies the etymology is very tasty bud implies the utter eradication from the mind of all neuroses, all fear, all ego, all depression, anxiety, all limitations, all of the stuff that we're utterly familiar with, and which in the materialist models, we take as an absolutely necessary, crucial part of an ordinary person, you know. So it's quite shocking to hear, we can get rid of this stuff. And then the da implies the development to perfection of everything else in the mind, all the good stuff, love, compassion, wisdom, kindness, that for the Buddha is integral to who we are. This first lot is not. So this is the, so if that's the end result of this journey, clearly the job on the journey is to distinguish between the neuroses and the goodness. I mean, it's almost too simple, but that's the point. So why is it so difficult? And what's it got to do with depression, anxiety, and loneliness? Well, everything. They're states of mind, you know, and we know they're the miserable ones. They're the horrible ones. They're the suffering ones. They're the painful ones. They're the disturbing ones. <clears throat> So what's Buddha's analysis? Well, we talked last week, love and relationships or whatever. And the week before, you know, the Buddha's view about the mind and so forth, it comes to the same thing. <clears throat> so the Buddha, we, as we all know, if we read a bit of Buddhism, you know, even one little child's text, we're guaranteed to meet the phrase, the three poisons. It sounds very cute. You don't go to your therapist, oh, I've got the three poisons to tell you to shut up and go home and wait till you have a bigger problem, you know? But the three poisons are our problems. So Buddha's view of the mind talks about the 84,000 neurotic states of mind, and he's got this, and then there are the 84 antidotes. But we can, they all subsume to three. 
And this is deceptively simple, but it's profound when we can understand it, I tell you. And these three, these three neurotic states of mind, and we discussed this last week, but this is relevant utterly here, because loneliness and uh, anxiety and depression and the rest are absolute symptoms of these three. So which of these three? And there's a hierarchical relationship between these three. In the ordinary world, we'll say attachment. Oh, yeah, I like chocolate cake. In the ordinary world, we'll say depression. In the ordinary world, we'll talk about anger. But we see no relationship between them. But there's this intimate relationship between these states of mind. They're intimately, inextricably connected. So the root delusion, the root of the problem, Buddha says, you know, is this primordially held misconception about the sense, about the nature of one's own self, that we've got this concrete, concrete sense of a self that is that is not in touch with reality. It's strong, concrete, set in stone, deeply instinctive, hard to pinpoint. And on the basis of that, this, and then that gives rise to the main voice of this, as they know, it's known colloquially as ego grasping, that primordial holding onto a sense of self. And it's, it's underlying, it's, it's in the constant state of panic and fear deep in our bones on the basis of, of that then there's this massive emotional hunger which, which is known as attachment this is multifaceted and then when atta an attachment is like this junkie in us that always wants wants only the nice things it's the bottom line really it wants only it can only handle everything being lovely it can only handle everything being the way that this supposed i wants it's primordial it's deeply instinctive join the universe people donkeys dogs donkeys mon monkeys humans you name it we're driven by this now what happens when attachment is thwarted that's aversion so attachment and aversion effectively forget the ego grasping that's just there but this attachment and aversion these are the ones we have to learn to become familiar with but it's really quite subtle it's quite hard and it's don't hold your breath these are very ancient, ancient, primordial, instinctive states of mind. These are the source, the evident source in day-to-day -day life <clears throat> of our misery and suffering and all the other dramas like, you know, pride, arrogance, low self-esteem, all the rest, they kind of branch off from these. So the key one here is the attachment, it's the bottom line. And so now loneliness is absolutely a perfect example of the deepest kind of most primordial level of attachment. Depression is an example of internalized aversion. So an aversion is the response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So, okay, so let's look at the attachment again. We, this is our conversation last week and the emphasis in last week was in relation to love and relationships. So it's exactly the same here. So attachment at the grossest level, at the most obvious level, at the most immediate level, attachment is this, you know, is, the, is, is, the, is what drives our senses and therefore our body and speech to get things and to do things that will support the eye. Now that includes eating the food and jumping on the next boyfriend and, and buying the next handbag and looking at the next divine thing and hearing the next song and then killing and stealing and lying and torturing if attachment doesn't get what it wants. Just check out the world, people. So the thing is, these poisons, they're there. Now, next to them, we've got, these are the negative states of mind. Buddha's view is very clear, like we've been discussing. You've got the neurotic, deluded, negative states of mind. You have the positive, virtuous, reasonable states of mind. And, we, and we've got to learn to distinguish between these. This is the point. And this is the hardest job on the planet because they come together like a big emotional soup, you know? And because also our materialist models, neuroscience and, and psychology, Get, take the give equal status to attachment and love neurotic ne any neurosis depression jealousy despair love compassion kindness we give equal status to these as normal parts of a normal person so normal that we would think you'd be weird if you didn't have this is the radical difference that buddha's making and it's hard for us to hear this so okay then so let's look what is loneliness well it's clear it's, 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 it's this sense of being on your own, a sense of disconnection from others, an overwhelming, it's necessarily a symptom of attachment. And this is where it can sound very brutal and cruel, like as if we're criticizing, but the Buddha's only reason to tell us about these states of mind is because they're the cause of our suffering. He wants us to like have compassion for ourselves, but it sounds kind of very heavy when we hear it. So, so loneliness, is a, is, a, is a sort of a more pervasive, you know, okay, the grosser level of attachment is for the cakes and the boys and this and that, for the objects of the senses. And the very first level of practice in Buddhism, junior school, entry level, grade one, as Lama Zopa puts it, is to stop, stop, is control the servants of the mind. And what are the servants of the mind? The speech and the body. 
So at least the first level of practice is where vows and discipline come in. Why? Because we're trying to harness the energy of our crazy mind. So we can begin to look into the mind and unpack it, unravel it, and then turn ourselves into this marvelous person, you know? So this very first level is just control your body and control your speech. Be a nice person. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't lie. Why not, Buddha? Because, honey, child, doing those actions programs your mind that produces your future suffering. And guess what? You don't want suffering, do you, Rabina? Thank you, Buddha. No, I don't. That's the fundamental starting point. Now, as we then, as we sort of start to harness the body and speech and get some discipline, we naturally start to get awareness of what drives our body and speech. And that's when you become a Buddhist. That's when you become your own therapist. That's when you really start to do the serious work of getting to know your mind and unpacking and unraveling it and working with it. So these words are simple, but why is it so difficult? Well, the major reason is because we're addicted to the external objects. We're absolutely addicted to the external world, you know. So it's hard for us to sort of to, to look to reverse the, the energy of this explosive en emotional energy that goes out and to look in and to see it accurately. It's not an easy job. So attachment is this emotional hungerness that's primordially deep, that's that's that there's the main energy of which is dissatisfaction. I have, have not got enough. And more, 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 more primordially, I am not enough. This is how it expresses itself very strongly, you know. Dissatisfaction, never enough. And it's second by second by second. So what's loneliness? Well, there you are on your own, but not just on your own. I'm sorry, some of the loneliest people live in a family of six people with a husband there every single day and you feel like you're completely isolated. You feel like, you know, and this is the way loneliness expresses itself. You feel you're completely isolated. You feel that no one sees you, no one hears you, no one has any, you don't even exist. That's the feeling of loneliness. And then of course we have these endless chatting and conversation and we, and the, the point, and all the time we're talking, we are wanting to share things, we want to tell people things, but we have no one to tell them to. This is loneliness, and you can see it by just looking at people. So why do we get like that? That's the, it's rooted in this primordial attachment. And the, the primordial level of attachment, they don't even really talk about it until you get to the body's path, path, you know? The primordial level of attachment, which everybody suffers from, and it's the hardest one to get to, is this constant emotional hunger to be seen and heard and approved of by others. So attachment is this kind of junky in us that's the symptom of a really, a re, like a miniature person. Attachment is the symptom of a person who's like nothing. So we've got to fill ourselves with the cake and with the objects to fill ourselves up. And the most primordial one, we need others to look back at us. It's like we need a person. It's like you've got to look in a mirror to say, look, I actually exist. You need a, we need a person out there to smile at me and go, hello, Rabina, you exist. You're a nice person. We crave that one. And that is so normal in our culture. This, in the modern world, I think the way we get become a, a well-rounded person, we need to become socialized. So we define ourselves, I think, in the modern world, and this is ego's view, we define ourselves in terms of how we are seen and treated by others. I mean, this is the hardest one to get beyond, but it's the fundamental problem. Because attachment is the symptom of a really unhappy, self-centered nothing person so we have to fill ourselves up with the things out there and then have the be and have and have the, the responses out there from people to, to shine back at us to ensure us that we're okay i think we all recognize this so what's this saying that i've got to stop having relationships no if we see this is the thing next door to these negative states you've got the positive ones and and the, the degree that we have any access to any kind of love empathy kindness patience generosity forgiveness is it that is the extent to which they mitigate the neuroses so the more the neuroses are, are prevailing the less you can access your virtue the more miserable the more self-centered the more neurotic and eventually you know if you've really got little access to any virtue you are what the world would call a psychopath I'm just giving the Buddha's analysis of things, you know. Of course, we don't use it. Buddha didn't use the word. He doesn't use all these Greek words. Every word in psychology is Greek, including the word itself. So the more we're caught up in this, in 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 the in these unhappy states of mind, the more miserable we are. This is Buddha's view. This is his assessment. 
And it's not critical. It's not being mean to us. He's trying to point out the, 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 the cause of our suffering. You know? We'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll continue. But anxiety is another, another symptom of attachment. Because you see, attachment's working every second and it's hungry and it's, and it's nervous and it's not happy. And it's always never satisfied with whatever arises, second by second by second, attachment's never satisfied. So always looking for the next thing, waiting for the next one, the next one, the next one. So anxiety is when the attachment's out of control and trying to kind of try to navigate and trying to control the environment so that the nice thing can happen. But it never, because we've got so much dissatisfaction, no matter what we get, no matter how nice the cake, no matter how much praise, no matter how perfect our body looks, constant dissatisfaction so this mind never stops anxious 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 and then what it does is and this anxiety because it's, it's it's attachment it's the control freak out of control then because it we can't control the outside world we can't and anxiety is this absolute panic and so therefore tries to is, is constantly then also manifest as constantly anticipating all the problems what if this happens and if only this and that'll happen and then that'll happen and then this will happen so we're just absolutely going berserk you know we recognize this it's like panic attacks every second. Some people have it more violent. It's all shake, but we all have them to some degree. This is the energy of attachment. It's so abstract for us. This is so abstract for us. And it's not going to go overnight. But like anything, we all know, if you have got a problem, you have to first identify the problem. If you can't identify precisely the problem, how can you find the solution? And then you have to, and then how can you find the solution if you can't find the cause? This is the Four Noble Truths. Depression, what's that? Well, the second attachment doesn't get what it wants, which is every second, to some degree, then that the attachment transforms instantly into aversion. And aversion is again multifaceted. And the volatile expression of aversion is anger, shout, yell, scream. That's easy to recognize. The milder versions of aversion, thwarted attachment, are annoyance, irritation, upset, frustrated. And that's where anxiety, because they all kind of come together, you know, this panic. And then the internalized, built up expressions of thwarted attachment over days, weeks, life, you know, years is depression. Anger, aversion, depression, frustration, annoyance, irritation, the whole spectrum are the responses when attachment doesn't get what it wants. This could be a thousand times a day. And this works at subtle levels. So like anything, you've got to start at the grossest level. That's why you've got to start controlling your body and speech. Get to have a disciplined life. Get some daily practice. Have discipline. You know, control your body, control your speech, control the servants of your mind. Already this is tremendous practice. Because the mind is berserk anyway. The mind is berserk. So at least you control the servants of the mind, you're stopping the mind in its track. Then you have the luxury to start looking into the mind itself. This is being a Buddhist, full on, exhausting in the beginning. Why? Because why? Because all our attention normally is out there. Why? But I, we know we're anxious. We know we're depressed. We know we're angry. We know we're lonely. But guess whose fault it is? Out there. And we keep trying to find the solution out there. Now, Buddha's not saying that out there doesn't play a role. Of course it does. But we give all the emphasis to out there. And if you can change out there, please change it. But what if you can't? That's when the real work starts. You know? Ask me some questions. Come on, let's go. That's just a summary. Any questions at all? Any old thing, whatever you like. Let's make it experiential. It's important to be experiential. Wait, anyone wants to, okay, so there's one person. Good, Alona, go on, talk to me. Hi, Venerable. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for Good. your teachings. Good, um, thank you. Um, I was um, wondering about, I'm about to lose my job. And uh, well, I you probably... They're, sacking you, are they? they're throwing you out, are they? Um, well, they're going to. It's like they, you know, they're closing company. Okay, and uh, okay. what I'm going to get probably lower pay job. And, uh, you know, my attachment to reputation, I feel, I think about it and I feel embarrassed. 
I feel, I oh my God. That. I understand Alona, yes. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, my, Christian, my Christian friend, she said to me, oh, you know, uh, God puts you where you need it. So relax. Yes. Sure, and, but I, I'm not, you know, it doesn't, I, it was, uh, thank so you, question, but Alana? I'm a so Buddhist. What's the question, Alona? Alona, uh, what's the question? It's from Buddhist point of view. I don't I think believe you know, in God. You study very well. You pr you're a good practitioner. You're very sincere. You've heard all these teachings before. So why don't you tell me the solution? Why don't you tell me the attitude you should try to develop for your sake? Why don't you tell me? Because you know already the answer. I know that. Well, I'm um, I'm looking at it. Um, okay, um, this I know what it is. It's attachment or to reputation. I know it's painful. I know it's uh, um, it is voice of it is not true, and I can be useful wherever I will be. You know, I can. Uh, um, um, I can be happy anyway, wherever work I, I get, and I keep practicing okay, and keep growing. That's exactly mm -hmm. right, darling. So why are you asking me? You know the exact perfect answer. You, you just passed your exam 100%. But let me ask <laughs> you a question, Alona. Let me ask you a question. Why can't you get a better job? Why do you have, you sound like it's set in stone. Oh, and of course, I'll have to get a lower paid job. Why? You, you're a very capable girl. You can go anywhere on the planet. You can get any damn job you like. Don't be so narrow-minded. Don't be so fearful of the world and its laws. You're in charge of your life alone. And you've got intelligence. You've got good conditions. You can do what you like. You can give up. You can start a new profession. You can do anything. So don't be so limited in your thinking. That's the bigger point for me. You're so limited uh, about a miniature thing. You're, a, you know, so many people just, you, you've got to follow what you really want. So what do you really want to do alone? And what's in your heart? What do you really want to do? What would you love to do? What's your dream place or job? What would it be, Alona? Should I answer it? <laughs> what is it? Tell me. What would you would really to want to do, Alona? I would love to be a nun. Okay, then we'll aim for that, honey child. And then work in McDonald's until you get there. I do not care what job you get. Come on, baby. Aim for that. Have that as your goal every day. May I do what's most beneficial? And if it's beneficial, may I become a nun? I don't know when it's going to be beneficial, but meanwhile, I'll do any damn job in the whole world. Who cares what people think? And then I'll save my money so I can be useful and have a ground so I can study and practice before I die. That's your bigger picture, honey child. So be grateful you've given up this stupid job. It's giving you some space to look freshly at options. That's the better of you. Okay? Thank you. Good, sweetheart. Anybody else? Questions, people? Oh, Wendable, we have a question in, in the chat here. Should I read that? Yes. So Let me, before I go on, stop, stop. Back to Alona. Listen, Alona, and listen, everybody. I um, always quote this. I remember some Australian nurse at some point in England, she worked with the dying, and she wrote a book, The Five Greatest Regrets of the Dying. Where's Alona gone? I can't see her. She's, there she is. Okay, and the greatest regret was that I didn't really do what I knew I was the best thing that I wanted to do. I didn't follow my heart. I did what I thought other people expected of me. So have courage, Alona. Think big. Okay. Good. Okay. Next question. Go. Who's there? Okay. So the question on the chat when Dibble was that it's very hard to meditate when the mind is full of anxiety. No matter how hard I try, the mind doesn't stay with the breath. What can I do? Okay, okay, okay. There's a whole bunch of wrong assumptions in that question. Who is the person? May I know their name? So their name is Amit Mukherjee. Amit, Amit, yeah? Yeah. Okay, Amit, listen to me, sweetheart. What you're just saying is, it's really, you know, I'm trying to practice, I'm trying to play tennis, but it's really hard to play tennis because I'm not, I don't keep hitting the ball. I mean, it's catch 22, honey. The whole point of learning to do concentration meditation is the practice of the training. So you sort of thinking, well, if all the anxiety went away, then I could practice. Well, that's like saying, well, of course, if all the problems went away, then I could play tennis. Well, that's the whole point. You're practicing to play tennis. So you just keep practicing. You know, the, the assumption is, it's, it's a bizarre assumption. The very nature of practicing anything, I mean, is that you can't do it. That means you're going to have problems and anxiety is simply is the symptom of the mind never stopping thinking. Join the universe, honey. That's exactly what you have to practice for. And it will take you, if, you know, if you're really committed, you've got to give up sex, drugs and rock and roll and go to the mountains and you'll spend a couple of years and then you'll get it. So be patient and humble, Amit. 
So another, so that's the first point. You've got a wrong assumption. Second point. In other words, it's natural that anxiety is there. It's natural the thoughts are out of control. That's why you're learning to control the thoughts. The second point is, you know, there's an assumption that it's a good meditation if you feel good. This is a wrong assumption. You know, your day at tennis, if you come home and you're exhausted and your body is aching, you don't say you had a bad day at tennis. You, you say you had a good day at tennis because it's the truth that you've been working very hard. So the, the real thing is the real benefit of us doing this practice. Most of us, unless we go up to the mountains, we won't get shamatha, you know. That's not being depressing. It's just factual. But the real benefit, Amit, from starting to watch your breath or watch whatever you're going to watch to start doing concentration, the benefit is that you see your rubbish mind. Because normally you're busy washing the dishes and doing this and driving cars and looking out there. We don't pay attention here until it's shouting. But when we're sitting there quietly trying to watch our breath, is we're anchoring our mind to the breath. We can't help but hear the mind go crazy. So it is good. Don't see it as bad. I mean, it is good because why you're becoming familiar with your mind. You don't buy into the thoughts, but you hear them. You see, that's what you, you know, that's that's the source of my pain. So see it as good, not bad. Because you're learning about, and then you bring to bear in your daily life this practice of focusing on what's of noticing, you know, not while you're working, while you're in daily life, washing the dishes and driving the car. Clearly, you're not watching your breath, you'd, you'd, you'd kill yourself. But you, you develop by doing the practice, you're developing the skill to harness the mind, to be conscious, to be aware. So while you're driving the car, part of your mind is aware. Look at all the crazy thoughts. Come on, I mean, shut up, give it a break. You know, you're able to be your own therapist. So the benefit of even a simple little session of concentration, don't assume your thoughts should all go away. That's naive. It'll be a while. But at least the benefit is you become familiar with what's there. That takes courage. So that's fantastic, I mean. So change your assumptions about what you're trying to do. It's like a, it's a bit like a junkie, you know, you, you suddenly if your thoughts all go away, you thought you had a good meditation. Not necessarily. And the other point is this the third point. They say in the classical texts, you know, in the Indian texts, one of the signs that this concentration technique is described in terms of nine stages of cultivation. And they say one of the signs of success, Pabonka Rimache in Latin, the Lam Rim, his text, he says one of the signs of success at the first of the nine stages is that you think your mind's getting worse. It's not, I mean, you're seeing what's there already. So be delighted. You know, a friend of mine is, a I'm going to swear now, I don't like four letter words, close your ears. But a friend of mine is a therapist and a, and a devoted student of the Dharma. She said, working on your mind, doing this is having your hands in your own shit. So we've got to have the courage to be aware and conscious of the delusions. But it's a difficult job. If we can't handle it, then, you know, we don't do it. Because they're the, they're the source of your problem. So you have to identify the source. That means you have to have courage. And then not believe them. That's the fourth part. Not believe their stories. In other words, allow the thoughts to come and allow the thoughts to go. It's like you're in a room of 400. You've got 400 shouting, screaming neighbors. They're all yelling and screaming. And normally we get totally involved in everything they say. We go nuts. Let the thoughts come and let the thoughts go. That's the skill I mean. Don't wish they'd all go away. That's naive. I hope that helps. Yeah, hi. Is this, is, this is Amit here. Yes, Thank Amit, you. what do you think of what yeah. I said? Uh, I, I agree with you. I, that, is what, uh, that is what I have been told to do. So I read this book called The Mind Illuminated. It's a, it's a great book on Buddhist meditation by John Yates. He, he's, a, he's an American who has written this fantastic book called The Mind Illuminated. Yes. Which which okay. is essentially a manual of mindfulness meditation. Good, and, I'm at the first, and I'm at the first stage there. Good. And uh, what you told me, I, I was not able to speak earlier because, uh, because I was muted. But sure. uh, I, I do agree with you that uh, we, we are to watch our mind in a non-judgmental way and just observe those thoughts coming and going. Well, no, if, uh, no, sorry, to be precise, in the, if you're doing the breathing meditation of the Lord Buddha's technique, you're watching the breath, you're, you're focused on the breath, and the thoughts are in the back of your mind, you don't pay attention to them, but you can't help but notice them, but you don't pay attention to them. That's the crucial difference. So, it's like, so what happens is that point? the, mm -hmm. the uh, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on my in-breath and my out-breath, and this yep. goes on for a couple of seconds. And then some thought comes and carries my mind away, you know, that's as right. if I'm on this boat. And then exactly. I have to bring, bring myself back 
say, Precisely. Hey, okay, I have to bring myself back to my breath. That's right. And I and I reward myself. I said, okay, good. I got carried away, but now I'm back to my breath. And no, you don't I even start... be too. No, even that I meet is too conceptual. You're training yeah. your mind to stay on one thing. It's like you just you're training your attention. You're paying attention to the breath. You, then part of your mind is noticing you wander off. You just bring yourself back to the breath. You don't give too much commentary. You just keep. Pick it. It's like you're riding a bike and you don't know how to do it yet. You get on the bike and then you fall off the bike. You pick yourself up and get back on the bike. You fall off again. You pick yourself up and get back on the bike until you eventually you can stay on the bike. No drama, right. no analysis, just do it. That's the job. Correct. But what I'm saying, Amit, that you can't help but notice the thoughts. Then so that's what I'm trying to say is in your date, the real benefit when you've once you've opened your eyes and got off your meditation seat you're developing by doing this technique you're developing the ability to be conscious to be mindful of what's happening in your mind while you're doing other things that's the benefit that you'll bring from this skill because in the end we need to become intimately familiar with our minds you know i mean to know to unpack and unravel the contents to identify attachment to identify love and compassion to see the difference between all these the concentration technique is a brilliant first step right so so the the point that i was trying to uh, i've been doing this for about six months now six to seven mm -hmm. months mm -hmm. and what I, the, the one thing that i have realized is that the quality of my decisions that i make during the rest of the day at work or family has a mm -hmm. great impact on my meditation when i sit at five o'clock in the morning to meditate if my mm -hmm. decisions have been good good in the sense not driven by say greed or mm -hmm. fear or yes. a, sense, sure. a sense that yes. if I don't yes. say yes to something, uh, yeah. I will lose the opportunity. And uh, you know, you, you, you get what I mean, right? So, yes, I do. What so what's the question, is, I mean, So the question yeah, is? So the question is that the quality of decisions that I make in the rest of my life, in other aspects of my life, has a great mm -hmm. bearing on the quality of my meditation. Well, of course it does, because it's all your mind, isn't it? It's all you. Yeah. So what's the question, I mean, What's the question? The question is that to have a good session of meditation, it's actually important to uh, focus on these things like a. You're not asking me a question. You're telling me something. If you have a question, Amit, um, I, I hear what you're saying, and it's wonderful. Yeah. But if you have a question, ask me the question. If there's no question, then I'm very happy for you. Everything's going very nicely. Yeah. The question is, uh, how does one bring in the courage or ability to make those right decisions in life, so that they don't come back and haunt you? Because that's what practice is, you know, eventually, that's why eventually first having discipline, controlling your body and speech, then learning to be your own therapist, as Lama Yeshi beautifully puts it, which is very cliched, but very powerful. And then when you learn the Buddhist model of the mind and you identify these different states, then you can develop more and more wisdom and skill in the ability to unpack and unravel your mind and to dig ever deep, to drill down ever more deeply, to see how in the end, we are all driven by this craving to be seen as a nice boy and a nice girl. That's the major Act. so that's it just becomes it, that's what practicing ethics is all about our meat every day you get better and better and wiser and wiser so you just keep moving and learning from your experiences you're doing beautifully it sounds to me are we communicating yeah so he's gone back on mute again good. When did, yeah. okay good okay did i ask yeah. the questions other... on the chat or sorry yeah, whatever you like whatever people prefer come on so, so the questions on the chat the first one was how to understand the panic attack if you already know that the reason for it is totally irrational and how to control the body when it's happening. It's I know that, you see, that's a really good question. It's like asking me, you're driving 120 miles an hour on the freeway and suddenly your wheels are falling off. How can I control it? Well, the simple answer is you can't. Or put it this way, the extent to which you can do something is equal to the amount of practice you've done in the past, the amount of driving. So most of us, if we get to the point where we are completely going out of control, which is one of the major sufferings in our lives, it's because we haven't learned to pay attention to the simple baby events. That the miniature little event of when you break the cup when you wash the dishes and the aversion arises and the upset arises. It's so tiny, it seems almost absurd to talk about it. But when we can start to have awareness in daily life, and this is part of my answer to Amit as well, if we can be conscious of what's happening moment by moment, and this is enormously hard, and then change our mind. So you break the cup instead of guilt and anxiety immediately because we're a naughty boy, we just broke a cup. You think, 
oh, come on, relax, Rabina. It's okay. It's only a cup. And you counteract it. So we can learn to do the baby events. We would never, never have our wheels fall off. This is the learning from it. So the best you can do when, you're, when your wheels are falling off is damage control. So I hope you have good friends and good support and loving people who can hold you while you're having a panic attack. Because you can't magically change it then. It's the result of a long, a long, you know, of uncontrolled mind. We don't pay attention. This is our biggest problem in our modern culture, in our psychological models. We don't pay attention to what's going on moment by moment. We wait till the dramas happen and then it's too late. Not completely too late, but it's a, we learn the learning is I better start at the basics. So I hope you have control, lots of loving, kind friends to help you in your panic attacks. That's the, the proper answer. Then learn from that and learn to have a practice, control the body, control the speech, live in vows, and then learn to be our own therapist, know your mind, do a practice every day and catch the baby panic attacks before they become gigantic. That's the answer. That's the answer. But we see panic attacks as some isolated kind of disconnected event, you know, that we just can't understand. Of course, they're irrational. All delusions are irrational. All attachment is irrational. That's the Buddha's entire point. But when we've practiced them for so long and haven't paid attention to them, of course, we only pay attention when the body's shaking, when the wheels are falling off. This is our tragedy. So the, the biggest one is learn from it and get back to the basics and learn techniques and learn awareness so we can navigate the little baby events and we will never, never get to the point where our wheels will fall off. That's the bigger answer. Thank you what so else? much, Vendable. Vendable, we have this big question from someone. So, so this person is saying that the lockdown, the COVID lockdown has affected their mental health a lot and it runs in their family genetically. Her mother has the same problem and she was afraid of getting the same and I and I and and she says that she's getting there, that her health is... But what is the name of this? Lot. But what is so, this genetic problem called? That, that, that her mother has the same mental health issues. I know, but what's the name of it? What is the name of it, please? I have to know the name of it. What does yeah. the West call yeah. the so-called disease? She hasn't mentioned that. The only thing that, so she's saying schizophrenia now. Sorry, what? Schizophrenia. Okay, it, that's, a, that's a word again, as usual, Greek. For, for so many symptoms, I can't even begin to address that, you know. I mean, if you've got serious, what the world calls serious schizophrenia, and you're hearing multiple voices, then you, you know, that's just, that could be the, that could be spirits, that could be so many things. But I don't know how to really answer that until... I really, it's too big a question because I, I don't have enough context. I mean, to say schizophrenia, I don't know what level of it you're talking about, you know? I mean, so, people use that word so broadly. Yeah, what? I think I think what she's trying to say is like, like she's afraid of going there, like she's becoming very foggy. I mean, I heard the question. I do understand yeah. the question, I mean. Yeah. I do understand the words, but there's not enough information for me because if it's, if it's, it depends on how serious it is. And you say it's genetic. Well, I mean, technically speaking, the Buddhist view is that mental problems aren't genetic because mind you bring your own mind with you. Of course, you can have the physical problem, but it depends on how. So the, so the question begs too many questions for me. I need to have a conversation and the person doesn't want to talk about it privately, obviously. But mm -hmm. I would, you know, I would, I mean, I would love it. I can't, I, I mean, I don't know what even to say. It's too big. I mean, if you're talking about schizophrenia, hearing voices, then that's a whole discuss a whole other discussion. I can't just add something simple here. It's too much. So I'd love to have a talk with you. I'd love to have a conversation if you'd like it. We can do it privately. I can't really begin to answer like that. It's too big. I'm sorry, not enough for me to understand to answer. So if a person would like to, you're very welcome to email me. I'm not saying you need to, but if you would like to, I'd love to talk to you. You know, get my email from Aman. Um, um, Aman, I called you Aman. You're not yeah. Aman, are you? No, I'm Aman, Aman. Oh, that's right, exactly. So please, that dearest person, I'm more than happy to talk to you, but it's not, it's not enough information here to do it in public. So what if else you is it? email, just write to me at info at cksl.in and I'll connect you with Vendable. Yeah. Vendable, the next question, if I could ask was, I don't know if it's relevant, but I'll still ask. So the question is, I work where my ex works. He's with someone else now. What should I do? I can't leave my job. I still have feelings for him and I'm ashamed to go there. What how can you help me with this problem? Please? I mean, that's enormous. Again, it's like layers and layers and layers and layers of assumptions in that question. Oh, my goodness. I mean, first of all, you say you can't leave the job. You sound like a loner, like you're set in stone. Oh, I can't possibly leave the job. I'm sorry. You're not in prison, honey. Whoever you are, you're not in prison. You could leave the job. So, but the point is this, okay. The, wis the wisdom wing 
the work we need to do on our mind, which is I'm talking about here, is, is becoming aware of our own minds, knowing our attachments. So you, so you still have feelings for this person. I can only imagine it would be very painful for you, unbelievably painful. You're still in love with this man or whatever, or have attachment for him still. That means you're still yearning for him to love you and approve of you. And if he's your ex, it doesn't sound like he's going to. So there's awful tension in you every day. So the point is this, sweetheart, if you really, you know, you've got two choices, basically. You've got the choice to leave the job because you find it too painful to go every day to see him. And you have to recognize that is a possibility. Do not say, I can't leave my job. Of course you can leave your job. You are not in prison. You either can leave the job because you can't handle it, and that's self-respect, or it's an amazing opportunity for you to practice and work on your mind. And so you've got to decide which one you can handle, really, in the end. Because, I mean, for you to go to work every day and to be completely involved in this fear and attachment and pain and embarrassment, you will go nuts, honey, and that's no solution for anybody. So you've got to know what you can handle. And if you really feel you can't handle it, you leave that job. Have the courage and you'll find an even better job. Or you see it as your practice, which means every day, you know, I don't know what practice you have got, if you have got a practice, but it means you have to accept that he's your ex. Try Your thoughts are full of him. I understand that. But just try to work on your mind. Try to be, and this is the one about loneliness. Why we have so much hunger for someone else to love us is because we don't think we're enough ourselves. It sounds so corny, but it's profoundly true. So this is a good example for you, a good opportunity for you to become your own person, to know that his, his admiration and love of you, and this is the real point about loneliness and other people wanting other people to love us. His view of you, has nothing to do with who you are in yourself. So we have to learn to discover that. If we just only crave other people's approval, we, we, we're like, I mean, I'm not joking when I say schizophrenic, we're completely giving ourselves up, you know, yearning all the time for someone else to love us. And if he's not gonna love you back, you will just go mad, baby. You will go mad. So, you know, the techniques are all there. I don't know what your practice is, if there's any practice at all, but you know, the Buddhist techniques are there one step at a time. But I mean, you've got to learn to become your own person is the answer and learn to not depend on this. And, and I mean, the more you feed that neediness, and the more you feed the attachment, the bigger it will get. But the less you feed it, the less it will become, the less pain. And then one day you'll look at this man and think, oh, who's he anyway? Who cares if he approves of me? I couldn't care less. I'm content in myself. So that's the best I can say to you, darling. What else? Well, when somebody wants to help out his friend because he's going through depression and stress, because many of many of this friend's family members have died recently, but whenever oh, he tries to help his help help his friend, he gets annoyed and doesn't want to share anyone. So he wants to know what can he do for his friend. Stop giving him advice. That's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. Stop telling him what to do. Stop acting like his therapist. Stop giving him lectures. Stop telling him. I mean, we mean well. This is the very interesting. This is the wisdom wing and the compassion wing. Okay, compassion is his empathy with the suffering of another. That's marvelous, and clearly you've got that. But that's not what enables you to help somebody. What enables us to help somebody is the wisdom. And what wisdom is, is what we get. The more we understand your own mind, the more you know your mind, the more you know your attachment, your neediness, your anger, your depression, your anxiety, your fears, the more you know that about yourself that informs you in your understanding of your friend. So the wisdom in you then means when you have compassion and then you know, if we've, okay, then you've got more wisdom, you'll just relax and let him be and love him for who he is, support him, let him say what he likes, just be there like a, a ground for him, be supportive. But to all the time, part of our problem is, so part of our problem is one of the functions of attachment, like I said before, is, is to control everything, to make everything lovely. So one of our biggest problems is we might have compassion, but it's mixed by with attachment and this attachment in you, I'm just suggesting this, you have to look, tries to fix him you try to make him better you try to give him advice that's what our mothers do we said we wish they would shut up isn't it leave me alone mum let me make my own decisions that's the problem because attachment wants your attachment which is quite you know you've got compassion but you're like everybody you've got attachment and attachment only wants the nice thing so in a way your attachment is trying to make his depression go away so you'll feel better that's the attachment side your compassion is genuine but then it's making you stick your nose in his business and that's why he tells you to go away yeah. I don't know if there's some decent advice in there for you, but this is, we're all like this, you know? Attachment is like this junkie that only wants everything to be lovely. And it's very, it can become very manipulative and very controlling and very kind of, we stick our noses in where they don't belong. 
We talk about our friend behind his back. Oh, the poor thing is so depressed. Well, he should do this. He should do that. Back off, you know, love him for who he is. Except, and then, but, and just by loving him for who he is and giving him courage that can help him begin his own process, you know. And if he asks you advice, that's different. Give it. What else, people? Wonderful. There was one more question in the beginning, which was, could you please explain the causes behind loneliness again? It was a very elaborate. Well, I mean, no, no, I talk about it so quickly and so fast, but basically loneliness. Okay, here we are. You know, we're, first of all, we're very social beings, aren't we? We can see this. We live in relation to others and we so take this for granted, we don't question it. And so naturally, Okay, given the Buddhist view, we've got this attachment. Attachment is this emotional hunger. It's a good way to put it. The obvious level of attachment is for cake and food and, you know, things, the objects of the senses. That's a fairly evident level of the need, the hunger. But the deeper level of this hunger, we've all got it. Join the universe, people. We've all got it. Is this, is this constant attachment, you see, is, the, is actually the symptom of feeling I'm not so much. I don't have enough and I'm not enough. The stronger our emotional hunger, obviously, if you're hungry for something, it means you're lacking it, doesn't it? That's the assumption of attachment, that somehow I'm lacking something. So that's why we are social beings and love and compassion play out in our social relationships. And that's marvelous. But what we don't see is how that love and compassion are completely polluted by our emotional hunger, by our attachment, by our neediness. Well, that's all attachment. And then by anger and manipulation and jealousy and all the dramas. So loneliness is this feeling of you're separate and you've got no one to share any, you've got no one to hear you. And when, when people talk about, I want to share my experiences with somebody, we yearn to talk to somebody. We should ask that question. Why do I need someone else to hear my thoughts? Ask that question. Why do I need someone else to hear my thoughts, to make me feel I'm valid? Because that's what we are. That's attachment. So we're all like this half a person walking around. That's why, especially, you know, we all have yearn to have a partner. And especially our cultures are so traditional, especially when we're very, still very traditional cultures. You're like nothing. If you, you know, you're like nobody if you don't have a partner. Even it's in our, it's expressed in our culture that you're nobody if you don't have a partner, you know. So we buy into these assumptions. So of course you crave to have a partner. Then you look like you're, the, you know, you have another half. Oh, I'm married. I've got this. So we feel all safe in that. But if we don't look into our attachment, we're still going to be lonely when you've got four husbands and 10 children because we don't know how to verify ourselves. We don't even know ourselves. And we have this craving for other people all the time to have to hear us and smile at us. And then we feel like we must be a real person. It's very deep disease and they call it attachment to reputation. It sounds so peculiar because it's so pervasive. So naturally we feel lonely, whether you've got 50 people around you or nobody, because you don't feel you're seen and heard by others. So of course, in a good, healthy relationship, we will listen to each other. We will hear each other. We will praise each other, but then our own heart so that we become fulfilled internally. That's the process. So it's not an easy one to get past. It's huge, it's huge. I hope that helps. It's basically attachment, but attachment is so hard to understand. Lamia, yes, she said, I could tell you about it for a whole year. You'll never begin to understand it because we've got to start at a simple level and then we go ever more deep, ever more deep, ever more deep inside, you know. I hope that helps. It's a slow process. But the fundamental point to remember is this. We are, everything that we have the potential to be is right in us this second. And our job, this is the Buddhist approach, is to become that person. And that person is an amazing, fulfilled, unattached, unangry, unneurotic, unjealous, primordially happy, joyful, loving, compassionate, wise person. That's putting it in simple words. That's what Buddhist technology is about. That's the Buddhist view. We mightn't hear it in such modern, ordinary words, you know. We talk about nirvana and all this rubbish, not rubbish. I don't mean that like that, but we mystify these terms, you know, we shouldn't, we should bring it down to earth. We've all got so much potential and we have to 
acknowledge our own potential. We have to learn. I mean, we say these things in modern psychology and it's so, the Buddhism doesn't say this, but it's true. We need to have compassion for ourselves. We need to verify ourselves. We need to have love for ourselves. We need to know ourselves well. And then have and that gives us courage then to own our rubbish stuff. And we know that's not set in stone and we can change it. So the whole job is learning to become this marvelous person. As Lama Zopi says, we can mold our mind into any shape we like. That's the job of being a Buddhist. It's a totally mental job, you know. And then we have really good relationships. We don't, we're not like junkies for the relationship. We don't define ourselves in terms of the relationship. Like even a loner's point, you know, defining ourselves in terms of our job, for God's sake. We've got to have courage. We have to define ourselves, you know, and have the courage. Look at that woman or that nun, that nurse, are so profound. The greatest regret among the dying, I didn't follow my heart. And we don't even know our hearts. We're so worried about what other people think all day. Mummy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, the police, the judge, next door neighbors. We're like demented. We can never even act authentically because we, we don't even know who we are ourselves. This is all a symptom of loneliness, trying to please everybody else out in the world trying to get people to smile at me to say, oh, I'm a nice person. You've got to find your own nice person. It doesn't depend on somebody else's opinion. Then you can have wholesome relationships. And this is a meets point too. Then you can have validity and you can come from a good motivation to always do what's most beneficial, to always act according to ethics. And it doesn't matter what people think. That takes courage. Then we become our own person. Then we would never have loneliness. What else? Oh, we yeah. have this question which is kind of a repeat from the previous one but sure yeah, go on. so this person is saying that she's very distracted and she gets a lot of anxiety attacks and she's very afraid for the upcoming covid wave in india and she and she is not sure whether she can handle another lockdown do you have any advice for her yes darling it's the same as i'm saying for everybody you know it's not not easy we need good friends we need good support we need good tools we are all fragile. We're all suffering. We've all got one or another problem. So we do need support. We need good friends. We need, we need our own good practice. We need good support. So to know whether you can handle or not, this is the trouble because fears, fears, which is anxiety, you know, fears of what might happen is a function again of attachment. Attachment either lives in a fantasy world of all the lovely things happening and you get all bol bolstered up or then suddenly you have a panic attack and you start imag imagining all the bad things happening. But in both cases, this is fantasy. And then we believe in the fantasy. So you, you're seeing, imagining all the problems and all the dramas. Oh my God, what if that happens? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And you completely act as if it's actually happening. So you lose your mind. It might never happen. But the point is if we, and this is where, easy to say these things, but we've got to start somewhere. Anxiety, delusions, all the delusions, attachment, anger, all the others, they're all make up stories. They exaggerate. So when we're stable, we can try to practice being stable and dealing with each moment as well as we can. What's in front of you right this second, you'd make the most of today. You make the most of yourself. You do what you can. Then you go to bed, you wake up in the morning and you think, I'm going to do the best I can again today. And you, you stabilize yourself second, but you're training to become a better person each moment. And then when the dramas will happen, you'll be ready for them. But just to live there anticipating the problems, you will go mad. And you won't be ready when they come. So you've got to train every day, just being stable. Here I am at the moment. Like a friend of mine, I always quote this, a friend, not a friend, the woman on the course. She said, I live in fear all the time that my husband will die. How can I live in the moment? I said, well, don't worry about living in the moment. Just face the fact that he will die. So one dramatic way of putting this is, well, COVID might get worse. You could die. I'm not trying to sound extreme here. We've got to face the reality that something could happen. But once you face that reality that your husband will die, not could, will die, then you don't sit there waiting for him to die and hold on to him and grasp like a vampire. You learn to make the most of your life because everything is impermanent. This is the nature of the universe. And one of the major reasons Buddha says we all suffer is because we can't stand the thought of bad things happening. So we live in terror. But the reality is things do happen. Your house could fall down. Your husband, her husband, I said, the face the fact that he will die. So then the learning from this isn't to panic, but to make the most of him while you've got him. Every day you make the most, you practice good ethics, you have a good relationship, you be nice parents, and then you wake up next morning and he's still alive. It's a bonus, you know, and you keep going. And then when you know the fact that he will die, that things do change, that you will die, 
then you'll, whenever they happen, you'll be ready for it. But to live in anticipation of them and living in fear of them, this is up the worst. You, you can't prepare for it. That's like you've got a driving test in one month and all you do is sit there anticipating it. Oh my God, this is us. What if I do this? And what if I don't pass? And I mean, you'll be a complete mental breakdown. How do you handle your, 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 your driving test in one month? How will you handle your husband's death when it does come? Practice right now. Being steady, trying, getting in practice, learning to deal with life as much as you can as it comes one day at a time and try not to believe in all the fantasies, you know, either the, fant the lovely fantasies or the ugly fantasies. I mean, it's not easy. All of what we're talking about is not easy, but this is the point in Buddhist practice. And Buddha doesn't, doesn't, he's not like a creator of all this stuff. He's an observer of the mind, a great skillful, you know, brilliant mind person. And so we have to learn to, you know, do that. And it's not easy. It isn't easy, but we have to also access our virtues, access your kindness and your love and your compassion and your goodness and your ethics, because they keep you happy. They keep you grounded. So just, you know, that's why it's good to have Buddhist centers and go to courses and have a daily practice. And we go one step at a time. What else, people? Wonderful. Those are all the questions we had today. What were our hours up? Gone like a dream. Lightning daily. Amazing, amazing session. Thank you so much, personally. Oh, uh, you know, just we, I mean, I'm saying a lot of words here, you know. But the key one is to have confidence that there are methods out there, and we're talking Buddha's methods now. I'm not trying to convert you to being a Buddhist, but I'm just being practical. I'm just trying to talk about give a general commentary, you know, on, on human experience. And then, the, but there are techniques there. And the Buddha has this amazing view, which is so optimistic. They've all got this marvelous potential that these neuroses, this anxiety, this loneliness, this attachment, they're not in our bones. We can mold our mind into becoming a most marvelous person. We have to have confidence in that. And then we'll find the techniques and we'll be humble and patient and go one step at a time. Okay, people. Thank you so much, Benjamin. Better, thank you, thank you very much. Keep thank moving, you. never thank give up, and thank have optimism. That's the main one. Without optimism, a disaster. You've got to have optimism. You've got to be perky and optimistic. I always say, I always say, even if you're drowning, stay optimistic. You might find a method to get out. If you're going to die, you might as well be optimistic. Never give up, all right? Thank you, darlings. Much love. Bye. Thank you so much, Aman. See you all next Thank Sunday. You, Bye. Ciao. Thank you so much, Rubina.